Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Inevitably, something will go wrong. I guarantee it. I don't know. You you <laughs> seem to have this under control. I don't know. We will see. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. Uh, it is episode 137. Today's August 12th, 2019. You're listening to, maybe even watching us spectacularly fail on <laughs> online. Spectacularly um, win. It's all fine. Yeah, and the name of the show is Human Factors Cast, in case you can't figure it out by the title. Um yeah, I'm I'm Nick Rome, and I'm uh, joined here by Mr. Blake Arnstorf. <laughs> We're here. Uh, how are you, Blake? I am so good, Nick. <laughs> that intro was the best one we've ever done. Uh, hardly, I think. No, I think you're the best. <laughs> so, what do we got coming up in the news this week? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're right. I usually do do a preview of the news. That's how <laughs> that's how jostled I am with everything. Uh, so, Academy Cadets invent uh this thing to support battlefield air airmen. And they're they got a patent for it. They did. Talking about AI minimizing maritime accident, accident, accidents. This See, I can't a, even talk. What's it, going on? If Blake? you What's can't talk, can't... this is not going to be a good day for me reading the news. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> it's great. Uh-oh. Right. Anyway, zero. Uh, yeah, zero. <laughs> zero S given. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Carnegie Mellon researchers. There's an airplane overhead, and I hope you guys can hear it because we are here in the thick of Miramar. We're, Aren't the they air so sh- loud all of a sudden? They, yeah. T- well, today for the air show that's oh what. Gee, is that already now yeah uh, september goodness gracious so. that's crazy anyway carnegie mellon researchers they have this wearable tech with smart patches and band-aids man that is loud i hope you guys can hear that <laughs> and we're talking about these uh robotic tails which are a little ridiculous but it's okay well Dude, okay. have you ever asked yourself if you want a tail? We'll talk about it. Uh, <laughs> right. But first, hey, you can find us on YouTube every Monday night. We publish these basically right after we record them because uh, we don't need Jeff anymore. No, that's not true. We still absolutely need Jeff. And uh, we want you to come back. Please come back. Help. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. This is a lot of stuff to juggle here. Anyway, Jeff's the best. He's hooked us up with uh, this stuff. We are eventually going to do some live streaming capability here. One of these days. Live and enjoy the show live with everybody else on YouTube. Probably Monday nights around five, but we'll we'll give you some more details around that. We should let them hang out with us while you're putting this together. This is yeah, the funniest thing to go through. That might be a Patreon exclusive only, like the hangout that makes beforehand. (laughs) The pre-show hangout and the after show meltdown. Oh god. All right. So anyway, yeah. Thanks to everyone for for sticking with the show. I know we were off last week, but that was because of a very good reason. Blake, what's going on in your world? Oh, man. Lots of crazy stuff. Not really. It's it's pretty calm. But for you, Nick, it was a little more intense over the past couple of weeks. Yeah. So I've been alluding to this move for a while now. Yes, which has finally happened for everybody that was worried or concerned or that's been following the show. Like, yeah, it's done. Yeah, let's talk about that. So everything's done. Um, We're still unpacking. Sure. Fine. I want to talk about recommendations uh, from online truck rental companies. I am trying very specifically not to say specific truck rental oh, companies. Oh, gotcha. So I won't do that either. Okay. Yes. So we're on the same bo- Okay. Anyway, when you go to move and you rent one of these trucks, one of these large moving trucks, you are able to reserve one that's appropriate for the size of your apartment. So... Hang on, I am. Uh, I'm just gonna do a quick search here for the website that I used, um, and I'm gonna look at basically. Which, by the way, you for anybody that hasn't moved or needs to move soon, you should contact Nick because you had like a serious plan for how you were gonna lay out how stuff went to the truck. You had all these modules that you were gonna pack together, and usually I'm just like <laughs> slamming shit in a truck. So it was it was pretty great like to help you move because you already knew what you wanted and where everything needed to be. And Thanks, it man. made it yeah, really easy. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. So to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit more on that, like I, I knew that space would be a premium and I got, I got the, um, 15 foot truck, which says, uh, or no, I got the 17 foot truck, which is up to two bedroom home or a uh, home up to two bedrooms. What? Yeah. No way. That 17 foot truck was going to take two bedrooms worth of stuff. Right. Although I will, I will say this: like pro movers, maybe they can pull it off. Maybe because I've seen some nutty stuff happen in some of these trucks. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I got the seventeen foot truck, 
It says up to two bedroom homes. So, you know, us living in a two bedroom apartment, I, fi- I figured no problem. Right. Like, yeah, because you're even your like your second bedroom wasn't full. It wasn't no. if you had like was, literally two bedrooms full of stuff. Yeah, it was mostly empty for the most part. And there's a desk and a bench. Yeah. But like that was it. Yeah. So here's here's the problem, guys. So I, I went through and I knew space would be a premium, right? Because I figured it would be tight, but it was really tight, like to the point where there was a point of no return where Blake Blake actually came over and helped me move. Thank you for that. We still got to have you over for dinner. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's a point where we kind of look at each other. We said, okay, not all this stuff is going to fit. So we kind of prioritized the big stuff to make sure that, you know, all the big stuff made it down. Anyway, long story short, I was doing the math earlier today, and I think there were eight separate vehicles um, or eight separate individual trips that, covered the rest of the stuff that did not fit in the truck. And eight separate eight trips. Separate tri- there was, Goodness. There was your car. Yeah. My car the day of. That's right. And then the next day there was my car and my partner's car. Okay. Four. Uh-huh. And help from a third person who was up in LA for the Shouts day. remained nameless. Yeah. He knows who he gotcha. is. Gotcha. Uh, and so on his way down, he packed his car full of stuff. So there's, my car, your car, my car, her car, somebody else's car. So that's five. Mm-hmm. And then we went up the next day and did my car, her car again. Oh, my goodness. And then we did my car one last time. So eight separate trips up to get the rest of the stuff out. And that's so far. It's it's close enough to be feasible and far enough to be inconvenient. Yeah. It was the worst. So it's about 62 mile trip. Um, Woo. And yeah, if you're doing the math, that's like in not rush hour traffic. That's about an hour away. I think the day that we came down, it was like a two it was hour. Two trip. hours. <laughs> the the, the craziest the- drive, and I was like, I don't know. I <laughs> I was like drinking two bangs or whatever to keep me awake. Yeah, because for whatever reason, I was super tired. It but was intense. It was pretty intense. So anyway, my point with that is, if you are a UX designer or a human factors engineer for one of these moving truck companies. Maybe, you know, say, give some examples of what could possibly fit in some of these trucks. Like, hey, this fits like two beds and a couch and, um, you know, a TV stand and a bookshelf. And, you know, like, give us some examples so we can start to say, oh, yeah, no, my stuff wouldn't fit in there. Dude, I feel like this is an AR application waiting to happen. Like being able oh, to yeah, log sure. all the like, stuff that you have based off pictures you take and then yeah. go like virtually put it in a truck. How crazy would fits. that be? Yeah, you just like do a sweep around your room like a panorama style and it like automatically analyzes what's in your house and, uh, you know, kind of scans dimensions based on reference points and says, oh, yeah, no, you need this truck. And that way you could take it into account when, you know, the wheel wells of the truck actually take up some space in the, yeah. in the truck. That, that always drives me insane. Anyway, you, forget the little piece. you mentioned these modules. So yes, I did know that space would be a premium. And so like I was I was very carefully constructing in the in the apartment. Like I was saying, okay, well, these two chairs can stack on top of each other and stuff can go inside the chairs and under the chairs, and then the table can go in the chairs, and that will be a module kind of all packed together nice and neatly and and uh perfect fit. Put it up against the wall, and that will lock in the couch couch will go in the back and then we'll flip the other one on top of the other one and we can fit uh tubs which i've talked about on the show of like with, with the tubs before kind of getting all the same uniform tubs yeah and, so they like rag and stack really easily yeah and all that kind of stuff yeah and that has been really nice let me tell you now we don't have a bunch of cardboard that we throw away we just have a big stack of probably 50 tubs <laughs> in our apartment in our storage but which is fine it's fine like it takes up very little space compared to, you know, something else. And then when we finally get a home, we have these nice tubs that we can store stuff in. And yeah, you're ready to go. You're not going and buying boxes, exactly. taping them up it's, and all that kind of stuff. It's an investment in the future. And so I think, man, there's just all the noises today. We got all what, of them. construction with the... Yeah, they're like redoing the course on the rock climbing gym next door. We're right next to a rock climbing gym. There's a course right next door. And we have jets overhead. This is a terrible place for a podcast studio. It's pretty bad. <laughs> it's it might be the worst. We may have to move the office to see if we can get to another corner. Of the we building. may have to, but you know the good news is that I live down here now, so we can we can stay as late as we want. On That's Monday true. We could do it later in the evening. Hang out, and yeah, we could do it after these guys have already gone home and have stopped with the courses. Quack. 
anyway, uh, with all that, uh, do you have anything? Do you have any other banter? I just got to say, it was actually fun to help you move. Oh, uh, thanks, so man. it was an enjoyable experience, mainly because now I know next time I have to get a truck, I'm definitely going to just pay for moves. I'm not going to try and move <laughs> stuff on my own. Because when you just when you were like, hey, come help me move. I was like, all right, I'll just ask Nick to help me move next time I have to move. And then right. after doing it, I was like, no, I'm not doing this again. Yeah, I, I think we both had that realization yeah. of like, it was just silly. we're not as young as we used to be. Well, it was just, <laughs> okay, so to start the thing off, and I I don't know if I let on that this even happened, but the first thing that we do is we move the couches in the in there. I dropped the couch right on my toe to start when we oh. got it in the truck, and it was pretty disgusting at the end of the day. But anyway, so that was so that was enough for me to be like, I don't need to be doing this. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to drop this stuff. And yeah. then there was one point where I thought I almost broke your cabinet because, like, I strapped it too hard to the dolly or whatever. Oh, yeah. Um, don't oh. let somebody else be liable. Yeah, you exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, next time, let me pay for half your movers. There we go. I, that's that's the help I can help provide. Yes. Okay. Anyway, let's let's time for me to uh, mess up this transition. So here we go. It's time for Human Factors News. <laughs> I don't even know. I, Honestly, don't even know if this is going through. I think it's going through well. We'll music see. Music come through? Yeah, music's coming through. Sweet. I think, I think this is fine. Anyway, this is the part of the show where we talk about everything related to the field of human factors. It could be anything from aviation to AI to tails. Tails to <laughs> smart band-aids. Yeah, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game for us to sit here and talk about. Blake, what do we have up first this week well so guys if you're looking for a challenge try coming up with 100 different ways to get a battlefield airman loaded with gear from a hovering aircraft to the ground quickly and safely and a team of air force academy cadets took that exact challenge on while completing their mechanical and systems engineering degrees in 2016 and now their technology has been awarded three patents by the u.s patent and trademark office to each service Academy attempted to improve the current troop insertion methods, which primarily use the fast rope insertion extraction system. So there are two main challenges with the current system. So you're trying to drop somebody in that's heavily loaded. So operators that are heavily loaded were, were struggling to actually break when they are fast roping with their gloves. We're getting too hot from gripping it on the rope in order to try and slow them down. And so to help them help get with the design requirements, cadets met with several groups of battlefield airmen. Human factors. Yeah, it does. So through a purposeful narrowing of ideas and potential designs, the team settled on their approach to get rid of the rope completely. So they decided to use an, an existing auto belay technology for rock climbing and developed a system for supporting technology to suit an aircraft. So... Here comes the auto belay insertion system that allows operators to engage one-handed brake without compromising rapid descent and emergency detachment from the rope in hostile environments. The so teams of two would descend from each aircraft at each side during an insertion. And addition, an additional benefit from the design is that crew chiefs no longer have to repeatedly recover a 300-pound rope during training scenarios. This thing sounds like it just like created more bang for its buck for guys that are just fast roping out of a helicopter or aircraft in general yeah. than ever. Because now you don't have to deal with a rope. You're just sliding down no br with a nice break instead of burning your hands off. Yeah, that's always a plus, right? Yeah. When, you, when you don't burn your hands off. I feel like this is one of those like very simple stories. It's one of those like uh, marginal increases in usability that is just like a win all around. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's nuts, because if you think about it, like, would you want your hands to be fried if you just dropped into some kind of hostile territory? No. Not at all. No. I, I need my hands. Yeah, yeah, you I need do. those things. Yeah, you do. So, <laughs> 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 but it, it's pretty, it's pretty great that the methodology that they talk about taking kind of mirrors <laughs> what we would do. <laughs> In terms of going and actually talking to people that do the job and then trying to understand from their perspective, what can we do? Sorry, I know how I'm going to sign off the show. Uh, what can we do to actually make a change? And just like using some kind of existing technology. I don't know if they did a comparative or a competitive analysis, but finding that auto belay technology that's already existing in like rock climbing. Yeah. It's pretty awesome just to leverage that for a different purpose. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, you mentioned human factors and, and actually one of the, uh, 
one of the first lieutenants actually mentioned human factors by name. They, the, the exact quote is, as an air crew member, I've seen so many examples of good and bad human factors engineering and the research we did for this project with the Air Force Special Ops and operators and air crew was what made this system stand out against the competition. So human factors gets a shout out in this, uh, in this article, which is awesome to see. Like it's, it's awesome when people acknowledge that it's a field, it kind of adds legitimacy to what we do. Absolutely. <laughs> well, it's, it's dope that it's actually coming from them performing like mechanical and system engineering degrees. So they're, they already have an understanding of what human factors is, I guess, right. like at a, you know, educational level, not just because they've had experience in the military. Cause my, from, I don't know about you, but from my experience in the past, people have been like, you say human factors on a military base or like to people who are familiar with military work, they're like, Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. But outside of, outside of that fact, you often don't really have people that are like, Oh, what is human factor? I listen to the show, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, all right. All right. I, Quick and easy. I don't. I don't know if there's anything else to talk about with that one. How was that rope? Three hundred pounds. Yeah, I don't. Right? <laughs> Can we talk about that for a second? That's, <laughs> I a get three hundred pound rope. I think that does make sense though, because I, I have one that's only. I think it's only like sixteen feet, and it's a good thirty pounds on its own. And if this yeah. thing is like going out of a helicopter or going out of an aircraft at all, that's pretty far down. Yeah. So I, I could imagine three hundred pounds adding up real fast. But the fact that you would be having to maybe recover that and then take it back into the aircraft, yeah. that, I don't know, the time-saving alone and probably the life-saving benefit alone of just having something Cost that lets you drop. Alone. Yeah, there you go. The yeah. whole deal. I mean, part of me, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding, part of me can't believe like this kind of system isn't already in place. Like This, this seems like a very obvious thing to me um, where it's worked in other applications and maybe bring it into this one. It, it, it's... I don't know. That's I feel cool. like the rope deal must have just been something super legacy, right? Like yeah. At some point, we didn't have any kind of auto belay technology That's or true. like yeah. maybe any tech besides, you know, use your hands with some gloves on. Yeah. Hope they don't burn through. And so it wasn't until like, I guess it, it was presented a problem like inside of a classroom. It's like that they were able to like, you know, sit around, think about it from an engineering and, you know, human factors perspective. Um, yeah. Pretty sweet. Yeah, it is. All right, what do we got up next? All right. So, supported by the 2017 upswing in the world economy, global seaborne trade has grown at a 4% rate, probably the fastest expansion in over a five-year period. Despite decades of safety improvements, though, there are over 1,000 large ships lost, reported lost around the world over the past decade, according to AGCS's Safety and Shipping Review in 2019. With the speed of innovation increasing, especially with the rise of new digital industrial technologies, known as Industrial 4.0, underpinned by transformational technologies of artificial intelligence and machine learning, sailors or maritime industry in general are hoping that they can solve some of these problems with AI. So with the mountain of data that's generated by the Internet of Things and AI and its human intelligence simulation power, you can step in and see how patterns can be recognized, how you can dis how you can connect disparate data points and analyze and predict proactively to, ex to exhibit autonomous behavior where little or no human intervention is actually required anymore. They're hoping that this can be leveraged across maritime tasks, including, including but not limited to reducing crashes, helping with the management of risk man management across operations, voyage optimization, maintenance prediction, and lastly, helping with navigation solutions. So all in all, the implement implementation of AI is to be put together in an effort to predict operational tasks for upcoming operations, allowing crew members to make better decisions and operate safely and efficiently. So Nick, we've talked a lot about AI at its current standpoint. It's really helping people to put analyze a lot of heavy data and then make predictions about trends or even input into you know autonomous behaviors that you could make based off of information that you're pulling in. But now it seems like this is gonna be a wider application into the marine space across a lot of different kind of problem areas that they have right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm the title of the, uh, the article here is Four Ways AI Can Assist. Is that the Ops Risk Management, Voyage, Optimization, Maintenance, Prediction, and Navigation Solutions? Yes. From my perspective reading it, a lot of it is kind of using the same concept over and over. Is you're, okay. you're basically doing heavy data analysis to help you 
determine trends and avoid some of the problems in these areas, especially when it comes to crash reduction or, you know, route optimization or even maintenance. Reduction. Yeah, I, I like it. Can we talk about these individually? So like crash it. reduction and navigation solution. I think those are like one, right? But those are those are one piece of the four. And then you have maintenance, uh, voyage optimization and uh, ops risk. Yes, sir. So with ops risk management, that's like... Um, is that crew? That's crew resources, and basically making sure that your crew is not fatigued, and and um, yeah, or you know, that like, you even so have the right people on board at the next kind of shipping or ship stop or whatever it may be. Because these, right. a lot of what this is talking about is like not nothing, no small boats. This is like dealing with a lot of like freighters and stuff right. like that that are transporting so much material that it takes a lot of people just to even run the ship. So yeah, they run into the same problems you do with like aircraft crews where you have to make sure that they're getting enough sleep, are like fit for duty and all that kind of right. stuff. But this is supposedly supposed to help you kind of identify where problems may be or predict further in the future how how well staffed you'll be and that kind of stuff. Yeah, this might be jumping the gun, but I'd love to sit down and have a chat with Keith Fawcett again and see how this may have affected the Alfaro. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Cause that was really, that accident had a lot to do with kind of crew resource management. If I remember it was right. The perfect storm. Like I hate, of using, course it was. <laughs> you hated using it then. I hate using it now, but it, it really was sort of the perfect concoction of, um, environmental factors, uh, and, you know, human resource factors that, that contributed to the sinking of that ship. And I'm wondering if systems, if artificial intelligence systems were on board informing the crew of potentially what would happen if they went in front of a hurricane or, um, you know, informed uh, the crew of, like, what was happening with the systems or um, also encouraged the crew to communicate better. Because I, I remember all these factors were sort of, um, or, or all these issues were factors that contributed towards the the whole thing happening, right? It wasn't just one thing. It was everything altogether. I think that accident, in the case of it, this, if this technology was there, and this is taking a very mechanical viewpoint on what actually happened, so take it with a grain of salt. But if, let's say this this kind of stuff was in, in place or whatever, uh, so you have a little more information from your systems, but if I remember correctly, a lot of it was based off of human decision-making. Like, going with your gut as a captain yes. and understanding like we been in, I've been in conditions like this before I I'm going to make the choice that I'm going to make right. regardless and be damned by whatever by what everybody else may be telling me so yeah, it, it's one of those instances where I don't know what impact it would have had would it be enough to over for the crew to feel like they could overcome captain decision because they have enough information to present like hey this doesn't make any sense well here I'm going to I'm going to provide some examples on how that how that taking that El Faro, and if you're unfamiliar with it, go back and listen to our interview with Keith Fawcett from HFES 2018. That was a really great interview. He kind of gave the overview of it, um, and I think the preceding out there, you can probably read it. Oh yeah, there's there's a whole there's all this documentation. He gave us links to a couple podcasts where you can listen. Anyway, do some research on the El Faro. the The gist of it was though that there was crew that kind of in the um, the Bahamas area, I think, right. I think the, so, yeah. Yeah. The uh Caribbean maybe. I, anyway, it was down there in that in that area and uh they were kind of trying to outrun this hurricane and it was literally the perfect storm where um there were cockiness issues with the crew and there were um you know mechanical issues with the ship, but that was due to the weather conditions outside. So that's just a brief overview. I can't do it justice. Go go look at it on your own. But what I can, what I can talk about is where these these four areas kind of touch that is specific example. So ops risk management. We already kind of talked about the cockiness or the um, headstrongness of the uh, crew, right? I think the captain was pushing. Let's go go go. We can make this. I've done this before. No problem. They're under this immense pressure to make sure the delivery's on time. So that paid and so um you know they're they're go 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 and so if if there were ops risk management maybe the system would have came in and said no we can't let you do that dave like 
you know. You, a good old Dave. Yeah, open the pod bay doors, you know, like. Yeah, turn back now. Yeah, so, I, I mean, like, there, I feel like there would have been some strong suggestions, not only through uh, navigation solutions and optimization. So, like, voyage optimization. The optimal route is probably from point A to point B, as long as no currents push again. Right, you want to go with the current and with the wind and avoid any strong weather pattern. So with that, it may have suggested to go up and around the hurricane, you know, rather than down and below it. Yeah. Because it's coming. Whereas if you go around it on on the north side, then it's past. You're just dealing with choppy waters. Yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> there's that. That's the voyage optimization. Then you have the maintenance prediction. This is the whole issue with how um, that part of the ship flooded. Once it hit that point of no return, it just kind of uh, took in as much water as it could. Yeah. And if if the AI systems took in some of these environmental factors, like wave height, tree, all that stuff, then it would tell you, like, oh, no, we don't want to travel in waves that are this high. And I'm sure there's already some, I'm going to say dumb systems. They're not dumb. They're like... Uh, they're just not artificial intelligence systems. They're systems that help inform you. Um, so, so those exist, but I, I'm just saying, like, maybe there's a little bit more smarts and, and data-driven pieces behind it in this where don't, don't go in a situation where the waves might actually crash over the beam of your ship and start to sink you. Yeah, it's. I think that's where a really good distinction to make, too. I mean, because a lot of... A lot of like the dumb systems you were talking about that are basically just decision aids exist now, but I think where AI really has the potential to kind of go a step above that is one connecting all of them, so taking them all in as separate pieces of data that it can analyze and say like, okay, well, this is the Rapto, the optimal route solution um, based off of what's going on and based off of navigation cues, but if they if it's taking into account weather and harsh weather and the impacts that that can have, well, what does that affect its last maintenance? It had? Or it does it have like potential to create this kind of problem that happened where the hole started to fill with water? Um, don't really know. I mean, it's, it's an awesome use of AI for sure. And I think like as time goes on, you will see a lot more like, I'm trying to think of another, there are instances like, like outside of aviation, maritime and aviation. It's a really good place for AI to start yeah. because it has so much, has so much implication if something goes wrong, like for the lives of people. And so sure. by using stuff that's per, much more predictive, and so you you have a little bit more, like even if it's just not in making an autonomous decision, that's like providing you more information and input to whoever is ultimately going to make the decision. Maybe you right. make a different call than you did. 10 years ago. I think any instance where you're massively hauling around freight. So even like, uh, if, if you think about the future of, of freight in at least the United States infrastructure, it's going autonomous vehicles, right? So that might be another way to optimize, right? Google Maps might integrate with some of these things and say, well, there's traffic at this time of day and you're going to be there at this time of day. So I'm going to reroute you this way. It might be longer distance than an electric vehicle. Matter. Um, and honestly, you'll still, you'll get there on time. It's just, you know, like it might be a longer distance, but time might be better. And as long as it's a safe route for the truck, right? Like you can, you can start to extrapolate some of these, um, some of these pillars for not only just maritime, but ground transportation as well. So it, it's kind of cool to see. And like, oh, you're not going to route an, an electric uh, truck through like a tornado alley, you know, like you're going to go a different route. Yeah, exactly. You're not going to put it in danger by, you know, making it cross railroad tracks. You're try to avoid those. If you also going to try to link up with other electronic vehicles when you can. So that way you're drafting and more efficient, you know, basically creating a train. So there's a bunch of different ways in which I can see this being adapted from the maritime domain to Ground transportation and, like you said, aviation as well. Absolutely. AI is going to be a, an interesting thing to watch grow as we get older. Yeah. Yeah. It's already come such a long way, like five years ago. 
it, it's going to be crazy to see where we are in five more years, where the show is in five years, and and uh, AI is here to talk about it. Absolutely. And uh, we'll be back to break down the rest of the news stories right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Trying something new with the Patreon lately. We're trying, if, if you like the show but don't like all the banter, all the bullshitting that Blake and I do back and forth <laughs> at the beginning of the show, if you don't like the Reddit stuff, check out our Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, uh, we have started doing these truncated versions of the show where it's just the news. No, no Patreon commercial. No, no bullshit about moving at the beginning. Yep. No Reddit. <laughs> no Reddit. No, no help. <laughs> No, nothing. And so, how, I mean, how long did the last one go? Like 20 minutes? It was about 20 minutes. Yeah. So if that's your commute, if that's what you want to hear, if you really want to focus down on the human factor stuff, if you don't like our personalities but like the news stories, like why are you listening to We're going to get show? our personalities nonetheless. <laughs> why, why are you listening to the show? But anyway, give us money and we'll let you listen to less of us, I guess. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely it is. Anyway, oh, that's so funny. The, uh, before we continue on with all of the rest of the show, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Sea News Core 77, Air F- Edwards as F- Air Force Base, <laughs> and Fast Company for all of our news stories this week. <laughs> if you want to follow along, you can follow us all over Slack. Uh, all over Slack. All over Slack. You can, uh, you can join us on Slack for links to those original articles. We do post those as we find them. And a lot of them come from you guys, the listeners. So if you find anything interesting out there, send us send it our way. And we will do our due diligence and talk about that stuff on the show because, uh, yeah, we, we love it. We talk about it. Yeah. All right, Blake. We got two more news stories. What do we got up next? Oh, man. So wearables are making a comeback per usual. The wearables hold a lot of promise, but most come in the form of uncomfortable gadgets or intrusive implants. That's true, but we'll take it. So researchers at Carnegie Mellon's Morphing Matter and Soft Machines Labs have joined forces to create a new type of wearable tech that can be applied to the skin like a Band-Aid and used for a variety of medical, fitness, or lifestyle purposes. So they envision a future where electronics can be temporarily attached to the body, but actually function and but are actually functional and aesthetically pleasing in the same time. So I don't know about that. I'm not sure either. Uh, but the team actually took a look at real-world inspiration for medical bandages. So they're easy to attach, they're small enough to be unobtrusive, and customized to fit other parts of the body. So the ultimate objective of the electrodermis fabrication system is to provide a design tool and fabrication method to support a process where wearable electronics can be applied to the body from a single peel-off step, just like a bandage. So this method would lo- would allow electronics to be easily accessible on locations of the body that were previously difficult to access, time-consuming to design, or even not even possible using these methods. Kind of nuts, Nick. I mean, they're basically putting wearables into skin. Uh, yeah. Or sticky skin. Sticky. So yeah, this is um, I I, I see the application absolutely. Um. I'm thinking about like the the example that we're looking at here is like the the piece that they're putting on this woman's knee. And if that is able to translate data like um gait information or like it like let's say you tweaked your knee or something, right? And it might be able to collect information on your knee. They're they're also interacting with it though, which is interesting to me, right? Like we've seen these sort of bandages that dispense um, medication uh, as a topical um, look cream. Yeah. 
Tropical cream. We're just talking about hands. Then we talk about cream. <laughs> what is up with you, Blake? Jeez. Oh, I know man. someone who's going to love this episode. Absolutely. <laughs> no, but uh, okay, okay. So they're they're there with these bandages. They're um, interacting with them and it records data as it looks it looks like right at least in this video. Yeah, I mean it, it's at least see, pulling something. Yeah, as she's pulling back, uh, you know, it is recording the information. So I can see the application. Um, I I don't I can't can't think of the exact application in which it would affect my life. I've got one. You got maybe. It. Okay. Maybe. Okay. So I'm not going to hop on a giant like rant and soapbox. Do it. But what I think this could be used for. So I've gotten, I'm really into like kind of trying to fix my emotions because I've noticed like, uh-huh. like most people, you're sitting at a desk, your shoulders have rounded forward. And long story short, yeah, by, when stuff like that happens and your body changes shape like that, it perf produces other maladies in different places something and because we're looking at the knee i'm going to use the knee example so some if you're if the rest of your body is firing like your shoulders are in the right position your neck's in a good position your hips are in a good position then your glutes are going to fire and it's going to help your knee stay outward and not bend in when you when you walk or when you move or when you do motions like deadlift or squatting now something like this can help you teach yourself what that actually feels like to actually move your knee in the right direction or to stimulate like, Oh, you, you, I don't know. This is really, really stretching it. But if you use vibrations, like it vibrates less when you get closer to the optimum position, your knee is supposed to be in when you move something like that or closer. Cause I, I don't know. Cause there's like a, I don't know. You ever think about like in, in video games, right? Like I'm going to go off on this tangent really quick, but Do it. in video games, when, when like, let's say you're looking for an underground object or something, right? The controller, doing that. the controller vibrates as you get closer to it. Yeah. So I'd, I'd wonder if that's the correct input, input methodology. Is oh, the, you're probably right. Yeah. Like, because if you think about it, then it like vibrates to a certain point and then just stops, you know, or is like if, oh yeah, you're locked in. That's good. You got the correct form now. I don't know. It'd be interesting to think about. Absolutely. Um, yes. I, I can see it for form. I can see it for form. Like when you're at the gym, you just slap these suckers on, calibrate it go yeah that way you're like always making sure that you're perfect form uh or or like rehabilitation as well yeah that's another big one you make me think that it's it could be a great add-on for video games that are in vr yeah especially if there's like some uh interactivity there yeah i mean especially if also it's like because it's just an elastic i can't i don't know what the expense is like but i would imagine over time the idea would be is that they're they're recyclable or you just use them one or two times. Yeah. Do they mention anything about Austin? I do I not think so. But looking at some of the materials, I can't imagine that like the uh, copper plus some of the other components plus this film they're using that are probably recording movements are super cheap, but they might not be a ultimate really, really expensive either. Um, right. And there might be a way to be reusable, right? Like you still have the main um, outside, but then you replace the sticky part. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm looking at this. There's a couple of different areas in which they focus on. So it looks like it's the forearm. It looks like the palm. It looks like in between the thumb and the index finger. On the knee, on the shoulder, um, on the neck even, on the forehead, and on the ear. So that's a lot of coverage. And those are just the ones that they're showing here on Core 77. Uh, and so thinking about that, like, yes, there's a lot that you can do with that, right? Like if you had this bandage on your arm, you might even be able to program something into it to where you shoot out, like, I don't know, a flamethrower from your wrist. Or, oh, finally. You know, rockets. You just have the controls right there. And you could be a bounty hunter. So, uh, I don't know, folks, this is a weird show. I've got a weird one for, yeah, you it's got not that, one? but it's, it's, so we've, we talked about AI in the last story. So what, and we, man, I feel like it's at least three weeks ago that we talked about this story, but we were talking about one that was basically allowing you to almost get a Luke Skywalker hand and you're yeah. kind of plugging it into your arm. But what if something like this that's put on people to have all their limbs or are similar body types and it's recording information, you just can make gather a digital and, avatar of your gate. Yeah, exactly. So you could record what, human movement looks like for a specific person 
and maybe that translates really well into you know the dexterity that's in a hand so so that uh, when you're getting nerve impulses going back and forth between a prosthetic hand and your body there's at least some kind of i don't know this is the wrong word data model for it to interact with and say like okay well we know that a hand is supposed to interact like this right so here's where here's where the impulses I'm getting, maybe I should like not do 100% tensile strength. There you go, talking about your hands. Again. Yeah, all over again. <laughs> um, but I feel like something like this has implications for that, like recording body movements and then being able to translate that into different medical settings, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I really like this, and and you know who knows, we might even be able to apply this to our tails someday. Goodness, you want to get into this last? I'm one? so excited oh, for this last one. This one. Okay, this is the go. best ever. So like I said at the beginning of the show, and I hope you've been thinking about it the whole time, have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a tail like a monkey or a wolf? Well, you no longer have to wonder. So a group of researchers at Keio University in Japan have created a robotic tail for humans called ARC, and the ta robotic tail prototype was designed to do what a retail, real tail does, balance out the rest of the body. So the researchers who are part of Keio's graduate program of media design presented the work last week at 2019 SIGGRAPH conference in Los Angeles, which focuses on graphics, gaming, and emerging technology. The appendage was inspired by a seahorse's tail, which is strong enough to withstand predators' bites, but still flexible enough to grip things in its environment like coral. So the researcher's prototype was also designed to fit whoever ends up wearing it, wearing it so the tail can be adjusted to the wearer's body by adding or removing modular vertebrae. And small weights can be inserted inside each vertebrae to help offset the wearer's weight, the goal helping the wearer to stay balanced or moving quickly or carrying heavy objects. Okay, connection now. So it could also be used in gaming to throw, throw the user off balance, making the game feel more realistic. Okay, ah. so just, be, okay, a lot of the silly imagery that came with this and the question at the beginning, I wasn't really sure where this was going, but now I, I kind of see I the merit it. of it a I little get bit. get it, man. Yep. I'm a, I'm a tail convert. Yep. I want it. I'm getting a tail. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of silly, funny jokes that we can make about this. and Nobody's uh, ever done that. No. Not before the show starts. No. Uh, there's some inappropriate things to talk about <laughs> Like how do you connect it? And and so <laughs> anyway, we're talking about this thing. Yeah, I think okay. I I now that I'm thinking about some of these applications, I would have loved to have this when we were moving. Because oh yeah, I might not have like tipped over and nearly lost, lost control of the couch my, yeah. or whatever. Lost all my bookshelf. Yeah, like yeah. There's, there's the tail could have saved me. The tail could have saved you, and more importantly, it could have like you know offset sort of. I feel like the weight of the could have helped us lift that a little bit more, have a counterbalance. Yeah, it almost lets you lift a little bit more weight because you're so balanced. Yeah. That you can get it higher. Yeah. So, and then the application to video games too, I find really fascinating too. If you think about like, there are moments where you get pushed over in a video game or something, your character does, and <clears throat> you know you to emulate that. The, the to emulate that the tail could do that. The could just problem, push you over. The problem I'm having with it is how do you do it safely? Because you just padded room like this guy. I guess. Yeah. I mean, he is in a padded. It's room. The only so. way to save you. <laughs> it does look like that. So I, I just don't know, man. I, Maybe you double tail it. You, oh, two tails. The other tail catches you, so you don't slam your head against the floor, but like, you still fall because the other tail catches you off balance. Like Miles Tails Prower. You've lost me. Uh, Miles? T okay, Tails from, from Sonic. From Sonic. Yeah. Like his got, tails? His, yeah, he's two tails. Yep, he that would work. To fly. I think that would be good. Yeah. You, now, if I could fly, this is that's it. I'm getting one of these and attaching it. Yeah? Yeah. If, if, if I want to fly. fly yeah. It, fly from, from your butt, just with the tails. <laughs> <laughs> just fly around i mean this thing seems it, it looks it looks pretty insane but there's one part that i didn't really read until right now and i want to read it for everybody just to get you a sense of like the the before the show. <laughs> <laughs> i read as much as necessary to get the overall gist um so but this tail because if you if you take a look at it i swear it looks like something from alien 
But so there's actually four artificial muscles that are running up and down the length of the tail and they contract and expand using an external pressurized air system. So that's the orange cables that are going in. That resembles a lawnmower or a giant vacuum. So that's how it's kind of like pressurizing and stabilizing. And I guess part of how it's moving um, is that air pressurization. That's kind of nuts, man. Yeah, there's a lot going on here. And as many jokes as we can throw at this thing, I, I do think there are some applications. And I wonder if you pair this with something like an exoskeleton that already augments human strength uh, and ability to lift objects. I wonder if you have that strength combined with balance, if you have like this perfect combination of augmented fluidity when lifting and carrying objects. Yeah, I wonder how exoskeletons currently handle any kind of balance. That's something I don't really know. Yeah, I, like, I mean, it works with the operator's limits, right? It doesn't let you go outside those limits. But yeah, balance is... Yeah, because if you're adding that much strength, you would assume, except for like think some things that have some hydraulics attached to legs or stuff like that that right. we've seen before, um, you would assume they'd have to be doing something like adding a tail that would allow you to balance that heavy load. Right. Huh. Well, yeah. who knows? This silly thing that we thought was, or I thought was silly, is definitely got more applications than I ever would have given it at first glance. Yeah, for sure. All right. It came from... It came from... It's time for... It came from Reddit. Is it time? It is time. Thank goodness. It is time. I'm giving myself uh, some of these, like, clean... Um, cuts. So that way, when I go through and edit the show for the truncation, I know exactly where to look. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah I see. Anyway, hey, we got we got time for one today because we're cutting it a little close. Are right, really? Minutes. No. Oh, we can fifteen minute riff on this one. Yeah, we we probably could. So, nice. <laughs> all right, let's let's do riff on this one because I do want to get into this interesting question posed by. Uh, User underscore underscore Ella decided that was two underscores. Right? Yep, double underscore. All right, they go on to write, what's the difference between a comparative analysis and a competitive analysis? Is there a difference between the two? I'd imagine the competitive analysis may be focused more on the business side of things, but they seem pretty similar to me. Blake, what are your thoughts on <laughs> comparative versus competitive? So just in case anybody wants to know, we talked about this a little before the show because I am not completely sure the like what? the 100% distinction between the two um cuz i'm more I, th I feel like i'm more familiar with doing a competitive analysis in which you're looking like let's say you're looking to design a new system and there you have competitors that exist in your market so you you take a look at what they're doing services they're providing you know maybe interaction patterns they use that kind of stuff well, basically what's been successful or in some cases what's been really unsuccessful or an existing product that you want to leverage or avoid in what you're trying to design. And then taking competitive analysis a step further, you'll often look to like stuff that's tangentially related to you. So things that are not necessarily your direct competitors, but it's innovative, like it's a disruptor like Uber or Lyft type of thing. Um, and you see like either what they're doing at a high level, maybe their marketing strategy or their design strategy, whatever it may be, and you try and leverage that, that into your own work. A comparative analysis, I'm not completely sure what the distinction is. I would assume that maybe comparative analysis is one step lower. So maybe you're focusing on things at a very low level. So let's say like at the UI level, like I really want to know, like compared to comparing framework A versus B, something like material design versus how Apple, is Apple user experience guidelines, something like that, how to two different design methodologies tackle a similar problem and what makes sense for your product. That's that's kind of the way I would draw the distinction. I don't know, Nick, you do you have any kind of sense of what makes one different than the other? I mean, like, words and descriptions are always kind of flowy to me in terms of... I To me, I think the difference is distinguished by I'm doing something competitive. I'm looking at a direct competitor. I work for Microsoft Office. I'm working on Excel. I'm looking at what Google's doing in Sheets. I think a comparative analysis is taking like a smaller, almost, yeah, kind of what you were saying, taking a smaller component or chunk. And maybe like I'm, I'm working at Twitter and I'm 
I'm making sort of alerting system to let to let you know when somebody has retweeted or or liked one of your things. I'm going to look at Facebook and see what they do. Um, and I'm looking at this very specific thing. I'm not looking at like my social media platform versus our social media platform. I'm looking at what you're doing for alerting. And I'm taking that in. I'm taking it. But that's the analysis piece. Like, what are we doing? What are they doing? What works for us? What works for them? What doesn't work for us? What doesn't work for them? And then kind of iterating based on that information, right? You could be, and let's let's use a more or a less analogous example, right? Because those are both social media, right? So you, what if you're making like a, um, a software for, I don't know, calibrating chairs, right? Finally. Or something. I don't know. Like you're, you're, you have this ergonomic chair that you're calibrating and I'm pulling all these out of thin air. I'm, there's nothing in my mind right now. You're calibrating this chair or whatever. And you look at maybe like a, a game calibration, center, right? Or a video game. And you say, okay, does do these types of conventions and methods work for this? Two completely different things, but you can still look to those um, components within a different domain, potentially pull some useful ideas. That's kind of where the disting distinction is me, right? If you're looking, if you're if you are working for Microsoft Excel and you're looking at Google Sheets and you're saying, oh, they use this function, users really love that. Well, let's pull that function to ours as well. Right, it's a direct comparison. It's something that you're almost stealing from the other company. I don't, I don't want to phrase it that way because I don't want it to seem shady. You're just looking out for the best interest of, of your users and what can you pull from the other program that they like and pull it into yours. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense, right? It, it's still, the line is very blurry because in that, in that instance that you just gave there, the reason that I would say it's competitive, right, is because you're, you're almost, you're taking stuff outside that's that's very successful so patterns that are successful in gaming industry and trying to pull it into yours so it's like innervating within your chair calibration space whatever that may be um but at the same time i feel like they're very very similar hopefully google's got an exact yeah i'm looking and uh i, I i'm not there's there's a lot of competitive comparative like same thing yeah. But the versus is always a, there's not a whole lot of versus out there. You type competitive analysis versus comparative analysis. There's not a whole lot out there. Yeah. It looks like it's basically using it interchangeably or exactly. talking about it both very similarly. And ultimately I don't think it matters as like cold as that sounds like just look to see what's out there. And if it works for your program, Put in, beg, borrow, steal until it works. Yeah, I mean, it, ultimately, the important part's the analysis bit anyway. Yeah. I mean, you're because I think in at the end of the day, you're looking at a lot of the same information um, in either one. It So uh, one thing that might be worth asking is, like, why are you doing this? And is Why the, are you doing this? Yeah, what... <laughs> Because that might inform you, like, is, the, is there some distinction that you've come across? Is your, does your boss expect, like, a comparative analysis to mean one thing and a competitive analysis to mean another? If that's where the question is stemming from, that's worth kind of digging and asking a little bit more about. But I think at a high level, the analysis is very much similar. Compare stuff that exists out there to what you need to create and look for what's successful versus what's not. Yeah. Perfect. 15 minutes of banter. All right. Well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the news stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, we will get back to those after shows. Now that I am moved down here, we're going to get all to the those. way down here. We're going to get to them all the way down. All right. For the rest of you, uh, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us all over social media at uh, 8 Factors Podcast. If you want to write us in an uh, email? Write us in an email. Right? Write yeah, us please an do email. Write in. us in one at uh, show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear, want to support the show, or uh, don't like what you hear and want to only hear the 20 minutes of news, you can uh, leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. Like I said, for as little as a dollar a month, you can uh, you can, you can can hear less of us. <laughs> I don't know why By it's paying a strong us, selling point. I don't know. Like, less. 
I know several people in the office who would want to hear less of us. So anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to find out what you're doing with your hands? If you want to listen to me less, you can find me in the Slack at human at Is HFCast. Or you can find me across social media at Don't Panic UX. <laughs> you know what? He doesn't do the video editing anymore, but he does uh, offer emotional support. So I'm going to say special <laughs> thanks to Jeff Olson for our My emotional support with video editing each and every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It, it depends. depends.